Dr. Truman, I think I'd like to start with you <clears throat> because you didn't get into the summary of your book, but I want to give people a little bit of a um, trajectory. You sort of trace the intellectual genealogy, if you will, of the sexual revolution, really, and the story. Of the, and, and you started that with the influential 18th century philosopher Rousseau, who thought that most of our <clears throat> our most natural and perhaps moral self results when we act outwardly in accordance with our inner feelings, in our inner um, pristine nature. And he, I believe he is the one who coined the term noble savage. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my question is, why did you choose Rousseau as the beginning of the sexual revolution story? And why do you think people, in, why do you think Europe in particular was the cauldron or the cradle of this? Um, these ideas to emerge? Yeah, it's very good questions. As to the first, the, the, I don't want to sound too much like a geeky historian. Uh, the question of where you begin any historical narrative is always a vexed one because there's always somebody going to review your book and say, well, why didn't you start it the day before? <laughs> there was something happening the day before that. And I've had some interesting correspondence with people emailing me and saying, why didn't you start with Descartes? Why didn't you start with the Reformation? Why didn't you start with late medieval uh, philosophy? Uh, one lady emailed me and said, why didn't you start with Eve in the Garden of Eden? Uh, and to which my answer is, well, the book had got to be less than 100,000 pages long. I, I, I had to start somewhere. I chose Rousseau because I felt he was very representative of a particular moment, that in the 18th century, in both religious and relatively irreligious circles, you have this wrestling with you know, where is authority to be found? And you, you ask a very pertinent question. You know, why does, uh, uh, what is it about Europe? And I think one would have to say it's the Reformation and it's mm. the, the invention of the printing press lead to a tremendous disruption of traditional external authority structures, which leads to several hundred years of philosophically uh, wrestling with, well, where is authority to be found? We see this perhaps most dramatically in Descartes, you know, of what can I be certain? Where, where can I find that, uh, that place where I can stand and be certain? In Christianity, at the very same time that Rousseau is uh, coming up with his idea of what we now call expressive individualism, this granting of uh, authority of the feelings. Jonathan Edwards, the New England Puritan, is writing a famous work, The Religious Affections, where from a very Christian perspective, he's wrestling with precisely the same problem. What authority do we grant our inner feelings given the problematic nature of external authority at this point? So I, I, I find Rousseau to be a very a brilliant representative and articulator of, of that position. And also he's been very influential because his theories about education really undergird a lot of modern theories of education. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not familiar with the, the Islamic community, but certainly in the broader, generic, Protestant American kind of world, child-centered learning is, has proved very important. And that kind of tracks back to Rousseau, where the idea of education is not the Aristotelian idea that you, you take hold of a, a little savage who's got all the right instincts, but they need to be sort of bent and shaped to making them into a, a civilized member of society. But the idea that actually the child is fundamentally sound and the school is simply there to allow them to express that right. soundness. Uh, and that, I think, is where Rousseau, you can trace a definite, I would say, institutional philosophical influence that's been very profound mm. uh, in the West. On that note, Sheikh Hamdar, I'd like to ask you about <clears throat> these ideas certainly influence Muslims today, sure. but especially in the West. But do you believe that the Islamic tradition is susceptible to the ideas that animate the modern self? Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam, Taslimun. 
just a little sure. um, addition to that about Rousseau. Rousseau, who really is one of the main, uh, I think, voices uh, that, there, there are many. I mean, the first one was in the garden, but there are many. But w what's interesting is he wrote this um, treatise on education, on how to raise a child, and yet he abandoned all five of his children who ended up in, uh, in terrible conditions in France. Yeah. And Voltaire was the one, actually, who outed him uh, because he's telling everybody how to raise their kids, and he abandoned his he's own kids. He's infanticide in practice. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's very interesting because that seems to be a lot of these people, these theorists. You know, Marx is another one. I mean, people forget, you know, his children committed suicide. Uh, Freud's uh, daughter also committed suicide. I mean, there's a lot of suicide around these people, which mm -hmm. is very fascinating, uh, who have all of these ways of telling us how we should do things that uh, don't come from either revelation or reason, but come from appetite. So it's just, it's quite interesting that that seems to be one of the, uh, the consequences. In terms, of, I think Muslims are as susceptible as anybody else if, the, if they're far from their religious tradition. If it, once mm -hmm. they lose the grounding of their religious tradition, they're open to, to everything. And uh, sophistry is, is obviously very powerful. It's, it's won over many uh, societies and cultures for periods of time. And, and the, the people that can undermine sophistical reasoning usually have to be very well trained and, and, and they have to be also public. They have to be out there. Um, you know, hence people, I think like um, Dr. Truman, you know, interesting name too, true man, um, you know, is, is out there speaking a truth that needs to be spoken. And a lot of people, you know, I know people that are getting death threats, you know, literally for just having an opinion about something that I think all of us should think deeply about given the impact that it's having on us. So I, yeah, I do, I, I'm very concerned about the Muslim community and I do see Muslims, um, I think uh, imbibing a lot of these ideas and sometimes without really even realizing it. You know, I mean, I, I, increasingly we're seeing Muslims taking as imams people like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, other people. Why do you think, and one more question about that, why do you think the Islamic tradition never had a Rousseau? Didn't produce that kind of character. I mean, you were talking about his private life as well, but just I'm curious what you think about that. Why, why they didn't produce somebody yeah. like that? Yeah. I think by the time people like that showed up, the Muslims were pretty ossified. Right, this is the 18th century. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I think, but I also think, to be fair to, to the Muslims as well, um, Islam is such a theocentric um, tradition, and, and it, it has survived well into the 21st century, the theocentricity of the Muslims. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there, there, there were a lot of antibodies to, to some of these ideas, but they did come in. I mean, there were intellectuals that were reading um, mm -hmm. uh, these ideas. I mean, certainly in the, in the 19th century, you start seeing this, the influence of European thought on some of the scholars like um, uh, Muhammad Abdu. I mean, Muhammad Abdu identified himself as he wanted to be the Luther of, uh, of, the, of the Islamic community. Yeah. Dr. Truman, I have a, one more thing about the Rousseau, then you, you also go after that to the Romantics, the Romanticism, mm. the poets. Yeah. You know, you have <clears throat> um, William Wordsworth and Shelley and William Blake. And then you have a, uh, you said something which really struck, struck me. You said, well, while we, you're talking about <clears throat> um, these poets, he said, well, he would not, he would no doubt have wretched at the thought, William Wordsworth stands near the head of a path that leads to Hugh Hefner and Kim Kardashian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just draw me the yeah. true line from Wordsworth <laughs> to Kardashian. What is that? Yeah. Just walk, uh, through, walk us through that connection. Yes, yeah, so a few people took objection to that line, yeah. actually, and fell. I'd, I was really too hard on Wordsworth, and I, I think in retrospect, I probably was. It was a, it was a bit of rhetoric to catch the, the imagination. <laughs> but I think there is a connection in that uh, what you get with the Romantics with this, this emphasis upon the inner self and being able to 
tune the emotions and give expression outwardly to the emotions mm. really does tie in ultimately with the idea that the authentic human being is the one who presents outwardly as they feel themselves to be inwardly. Right. Now, the difference between, say, a Hugh Hefner, well, there are numerous differences between a Hugh Hefner <laughs> and a William Wordsworth. Uh, one of them, I think, is that Wordsworth would certainly have regarded human nature as having a moral shape and a structure. So for him, it wasn't simply a case of letting it all hang out. He would have had a definite vision of what a civilized, yeah, or maybe civil is the wrong word, but what a, a morally attuned person would be. Uh, and even Rousseau would have been like that. I mean, I think we, we all understand that uh, morality and ethics have what one might call an effective or even an aesthetic component in that, you know, if we walk out uh, of the meeting tonight and we see somebody be mugged on the other side of the street and we don't feel something, we have to Google, is that a good thing or a bad thing? What should I do? I, I think we'd say that th that person who has to do that is, is morally inadequate in some way. That Wordsworth is, uh, and, and even Rousseau, are correct that morality has to have a, an effective grounding as well. Mm -hmm. What happens, I think, is the, in, in, say, the gap between Wordsworth and, and Hefner is that notion of any kind of moral structure disappears. So all you end up with are feelings completely detached from any kind of moral teleology or moral structure. Uh, and so, yeah, and that... But did Rousseau or the poets realize what they were doing or what they were unleashing in a way? Is that what you're I, I think if you, some romantics I think are more radical than others. Shelley is definitely a sexual revolutionary in a way that I don't think Wordsworth is a sexual mm -hmm. revolutionary. Byron. I think with, with Wordsworth, he, it, I hope I'm not misrepresenting, but I think there's a, almost a kind of panentheistic view right. of the world, where the world itself has a kind of divine structure and conforming myself to that, which happens to correlate precisely with who I should be in the first place, will lead to a moral society. Uh, so I don't think the romantics are consciously trying to, or not all of them, consciously trying to bring about a sexual revolution. Shelley, I think, is different. William Blake right. is different. But right. Wordsworth and Coleridge, no. Shekham, any thoughts about that, the poets, the romantics? And, and well, I mean, they, you know, they follow the metaphysical poets. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's a move into sentiment from, from, from uh, some okay. higher order thinking. Right. So, um, yeah, the, you, I mean, there's there's very interesting evolutions that you can see, and literature certainly plays a major role. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, by the end of the 19th century, you have the Ars Gracia Artis, which becomes, you know, a uh, a motto for mm -hmm. one of the major Hollywood studios. MGM. MGM. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with the the Roaring Lion, Roaring which lion. is yeah. taken out of, yeah. uh, you know, the devil is like a roaring yeah. lion yeah. out of the New Testament. So so. Um, and Oscar Wilde was obviously at the heart of that movement, yeah. which was prior to that, it was art for God's sake. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a higher purpose to art. Mm -hmm. And so then it becomes art for art's sake. And um, once you remove God from art, really art dissipates right. in, in any right. serious way. But I think the idea of moral sentiment, which becomes increasingly important with people like by the time Adam Smith is writing, I mean, that's how he's looking at it. And, it, and, and, and they see morality as feelings more than uh, as, as, as a, a habitus of the soul that's acquired over effort. You know, it's that what we don't like uh, is uh, what we don't, uh, what we like is good and what we don't like is, is bad. And, and it, it, it becomes subjectivity that we're looking, morality becomes something that uh, is experienced in the interior of, of the individual, as opposed to something that has an objective reality that's identifiable, yeah, so. And that's so key, I think, to the transformation that's taking place. Uh, I remember around about 2014, I was teaching at a seminary and I had students asking me, 
you know, can you give us good arguments against gay marriage? And my mm. answer was, I give you numerous good arguments against <laughs> gay marriage, but none of them will work because most of the people who are now pro-gay marriage have not come to that position because of an argument. They've come because they've seen a movie or a sitcom. Their emotions have been transformed and attuned by the products of culture to which they've been exposed. And that's where I think, again, as we look at the rising generation of young people, we need to realize we can't necessarily argue them to hold the same positions mm. because they've not been argued out of those positions. It's other things in play that have shaped their, their moral intuitions, for want of a better term. I'd like to, on that point, you just said something else you, early in your book, you talk about um, the social imaginary. Mm. And I'm curious, because most people, as you said, don't read all these thinkers, haven't yeah. read the books, and haven't, yeah. but they still have imbibed yeah. the ideas. Yeah. So talk about what that imaginary is, and how does that, those thoughts on those thinkers, those ideas filter down to everybody in the culture? Yeah, well, the social imaginary is a term used by the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor to talk about how cultures operate, really. And he's mm -hmm. making this point that, uh, you know, people don't read Marx, they don't read Nietzsche, they don't read Freud, mm -hmm. and they don't have to have read them to actually have intuitions that operate along Marxist, Freudian, Nietzschean kind of lines because the social imaginary really refers to the way we, we actually live. Uh, we live in ways that, that shape our instinctive relationship to the world. I mean, I could use a very trivial example. I, I have a colleague from Grove City here tonight actually who teaches in the, in the STEM section of the, uh, of the college and he will confirm that I'm utterly ignorant about science. Uh, but you know, when I leave the room tonight, I'm gonna leave through the door at the back. I don't know how atoms work, I don't know how door, I don't know the scientific argument for why doors are good for leaving rooms rather than walls. It's just intuitively that's my experience and it makes sense. When you transfer that into other realms of human existence, uh, morality for example, very few of us have read you know, profound tomes on morality that have persuaded us that stealing's wrong. It's just mum and dad brought us up that way. Our intuitions have been shaped in a way that we just instinctively know that, that, mm -hmm. that stealing is wrong. We may not be able to give a watertight argument as to why, but we just know. And Taylor's trying to get at the fact that, in some ways one might say, the most important beliefs we have about life, the universe, morality, etc., are intuitive beliefs. Mm -hmm. Not often reinforced by arguments, but reinforced often by, by social be behaviors. So in the Christian church, for example, we, we don't just have a preaching on Sunday, we'll also have these things called sacraments. We'll have baptism, we'll have the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. We have rituals that aren't arguments, but have an effect on the emotions, and therefore over time, cumulatively, transform the way we think about the world. Mm. And that I think is very important when we think about the sexual revolution to realize this is not the result that somebody came up with a great argument. It's, for example, hey, somebody developed the pill. And once you have the pill, you can mm -hmm. start thinking that sex is recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, you can start acting that way and getting away with it. It's not an argument, it's an intuition shaped by a technology that has fashioned a particular kind of behavior. Right. Is that the zeitgeist, is that what that well, is? Well, you know, it's very interesting that um, you know, I, I don't think trickle-down economics is real, but, but I do believe in trickle-down philosophy. Like, philosophy really does trickle down. Mm. And, and so the ideas of philosophers of one generation become a common, common mm. coin of, of the succeeding generations if they're, if they're powerful enough, um, and if, if they take hold amongst the intellectuals. Of, of that community. So, but you can see, if, if you just look at certain aspects of just human beings, um, there has always been these type of phenomena in, in, in the human. I mean, we have the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we, we, we also know, for instance, I mean, uh, a really interesting uh, narrative is uh, Rabelais, who, who wrote this uh, famous book about these two giants, the father and the son, 
uh, Gargantua and, and Pantagruel. And in there he has this abbey that uh, Gargantua builds called the Abbey of Thelema. And he inverts all of these ideas. He was actually at one time a Franciscan uh, monk, and there's a whole, a whole debate about if he was anti-Christian or if he was a Christian humanist, but um, that, I'll leave that to the Rabelaisian experts. Um, but, but the Abbey of Thelema, written over it as you go in is, uh, do what thou wilt. And he inverts the, the traditional oaths, uh, you know, these, these um, covenants that the, the monks take of chastity, poverty, and obedience. And he turns them to richness and then uh, uh, noble relations mm -hmm. and, um, and freedom. Licentious, basically saying that the reason that people sin is because there are laws. So if we get rid of these laws, there's nothing to rebel against. And that human beings will be good because it's their nature to be good if they're not told what to do. So that moves into some really interesting people in, in the uh, 18th century. So you get these people like um, uh, Lord Wharton, who starts the Hellfire Club. And uh, these are people that literally get together in England. They have prostitutes dress up as nuns. They, they, uh, they come in mock costumes of biblical characters. And they have a, a, a rakish good time in their clubs. And that, and that created these gentlemen clubs uh, where, where they would go and do outrageous things. Um, so the, the elites were rebelling, mm. but they kind mm. of saw that it was important to keep the masses believing these things. Like, for instance, uh, in, 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 Rush, in Russia, the, the, a lot of the aristocrats were atheists, um, but they spoke in French when they wanted to talk about this because they didn't want their servants to hear these things because they understood that if these ideas get out there, then people are gonna rebel. Well, once you kind of get rid of all the aristocracy and then you create these democracies, you don't really need those rules anymore in the same way. You don't need to keep the masses in the same type. And so you have, um, you have this really interesting movement called uh, Hintonism, which is um, James Hinton, who was a, a preacher in London. And he ended up uh, kind of, again, having as his theme, do what thou wilt. Love and do what thou wilt. And so uh, from him, there's a character, you know, Aleister Crowley, right. who then, um, Re revives the Rabelais um, Abbey of Thalema. So he was a bisexual and wanted to liberate people from the tyranny of these social constraints because he thought that they should be free. And in fact, he said that the time is coming when people will be free of the tyranny of being a male or a female, where they could actually choose. And he wrote this in 1905. So this has been going on for a while. There was, there's another character, Havelock Ellis, mm -hmm. who uh, again wrote a six volume work on the psychology of, of sex. Um, he was a, a bisexual also, and uh, his wife was an open bisexual, uh, Lise, and, and actually promoted like open marriage and these things. Mm -hmm. Well, one of his acolytes was uh, Margaret Sanger, who starts um, Planned, Planned Parenthood because he was a big promoter of birth control. And birth control is central to this whole transformation. W without birth control, a lot of these things just would not have happened. So birth control was very, very important. So, so you can see these, these lineages, but you can even go further back in the United States. We had a very interesting lady who came from, from Scotland um, uh, Fanny Wright, uh, Francis Wright, who was a free thinker, amazing lady. Um, she was an abolitionist, she was a socialist. So she started this commune in, te in Tennessee called Neshova, where there was free sex, no marriage. She, she was invited to by Thomas Jefferson you know, to <laughs> it's just amazing stuff. So, you know, the elites have always kind of had right. these interests and there were Fanny Wright um, societies all over America. She toured all over. And then you have this very interesting character, Magnus uh, Hirschfeld, who uh, 
was also a homosexual, heavily influenced by um, uh, Freud and by uh, Havelock Ellis, very interested in that. But he, went, he became a physician, and then he basically coined the term transvestite and uh, wrote a lot about homosexuality. He was homosexual himself and performed the first transgender operation in 1927. Um, and argued, you know, that we need to allow people to be themselves. He was the first person also to make the argument that homosexuality was something you were born with because he di differed with Freud, uh, who believed it was actually usually some uh, unhealthy uh, uh, attachment to the mother, I think, yeah. was his yeah. uh, Failure of the Oedipus Club complex, right. yeah. So. I want to get back to um, this idea of nature and human nature. Um, and Shikhan, I wanted to ask you, I mean, this idea that Dr. Truman just explained about the inner feelings being considered authentic, that that's my authentic self, what I feel inside, right? And this comes from Rousseau's idea of, of human you know, uh, nature. But Rousseau also departed from the Christian idea of the original sin. He believed that people are born moral, right? And that society corrupts them. You know, the, it's society's fault, not my fault. Um, but in Islam, the prophetic tradition we have it teaches that every child is born in conformity with, na with the nature and the, fit the idea of the fitra. So I'd like you to address this notion that, you know, on the face of it, it seems like that aligns with Rousseau's idea of a moral, you know, being that people are born with the moral nature. And yet it's not, so how do we, understand the fitra in terms of the Rousseau and the Christian tradition of, of the original sin. Do you want to come on on that first? And then I'll... Uh, 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 I simply affirm that what you're saying is correct about Rousseau. I, even in an odd way, I think uh, Nietzsche and Freud uh, are closer to what Christians believe about you know, Nietzsche and Freud don't believe it's fallen human nature, but in Christianity, while we believe that you know, Adam and Eve are created pristine, the fall corrupts and that all the progeny of Adam and Eve are, are, are corrupted after that, which functionally actually makes Freud and Nietzsche more insightful from my perspective because they realize human beings as we're now constituted are, have a dark and destructive tilt and, and drive. I mean, I think uh, for Muslims, you get into debates about uh, about natural law. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a soft natural law. I don't think it's a hard natural law, but there is a soft natural law in our tradition um, which recognizes, you know, we have this tradition of husn and qubah, which has three uh, elements. Um, so, w which is basically the ascetic aspect of ethics, you know, that good deeds are beautiful, bad deeds are ugly, and that the intellect has access to to certain, uh, certain elements within that. Like for instance, the intellect, it's rational to understand that knowledge is good and that um, ignorance is bad. But in relation to judgment, which relates to punishments and to reward, uh, that's God's domain only. So the, the dominant opinion amongst the Muslims is that that is the realm of God, and that has to be introduced, and that's where the messengers come, the prophets come, to inform people what's, what's expected and what they will be rewarded and punished for. And so the idea is if that warner does not come, then they're not held accountable in terms of rewards and punishments. Um, so, but the fitra, this idea of the principial nature of the human being, is that human beings are born with an inclination to truth, but there's default settings that they have to, to deal with. And, and so there's an inclination, um, you know, everybody, it's a fallen nature. We, I mean, we don't have the Augustinian original sin concept, right. but we do understand that we're in a fallen state, that we were in uh, uh, Eden, and, and now we're in the, this dunya, and we have this proclivity um, which the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulukum khata'un, all of you are sinners. And when they complained about sin, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you didn't sin, God would create people that uh, would sin. And uh, because one of his names is Tawab, the one who, re who turns to the repentant. Mm. So in, uh, Allah is, is expressing his, uh, God's nature 
in that so so that we we do and he said also that if you didn't sin the angels would be shaking your hands on the streets <laughs> so so it's part of human nature and i think the worst thing about what's happened in our civilization and what's happening globally you know christ said to the uh to the woman who was being condemned by uh people um for having committed uh, adultery you know once he says to whoever hasn't sinned let him cast the first stone um, when they all leave he looks at her and asks where her accusers are and then he tells her you know I, then i i don't have anything go and sin no more what the antichrist says is go there is no more sin so it's an inversion of of that truth which is that we have to repent but if there's no sin there's nothing to repent from and that's why one, one of my teachers told me whatever you tell the muslims uh, in, in, just tell them to make sure never to permit the impermissible because once they do that they close the door of repentance and that door is always open as long as you haven't closed it. I ask about that because what you just touched upon, it seems the world we're living in right now, the societal um, trends that are going on, these ideas about the sexual revolution, everything seems to be pulling us away from that principal nature. I mean, it's hard to, how, you know, that, yeah. how do we retain that? In, well, in, in, we, it, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described holding on to religion in the latter days like holding on to a hot coal in your hand. It's how, how difficult it would be. And, and the current um, cultural phenomena that we're seeing is, is so harmful to, to the young people, to the children. I mean, they're growing up being indoctrinated into things that um, are just, you know, they're, they're, they're robbing them of their innocence. And, 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 and we have an obligation as parents to try to keep them in that innocence. They'll come out of the garden yeah. of childhood, but we should do as parents our best at keeping them in that garden. But th there's something that, you know, a lot of the people that promote certain uh, uh, as aspects of, of what uh, Dr. Truman talks about in this book, you know, they have this idea of the dominance of innocence that they, they the, the reason they have a drag queen hour is because they want to uh, uh, enculturate these young children into the idea that this is normal. Because they believe that if you, if you leave them in a heteronormative culture, and that's the word they use, uh, if you leave them in a culture that, where heterosexuality is the norm, then they're gonna see that as abnormal. So you have to get them as early as possible to break down that barrier so that then it, they normalize it. You know, the Arabs have a saying, Zabal ta'ud Zabala. You know, the stable boy gets used to the stench. Mm. You know, so if you, you know, if you can get them early, and this is a, a, a Jesuit principle, you know, if we have them before seven, we'll have them on our deathbeds. I mean, getting, getting the children as early as possible is going to ensure that the, uh, what you're teaching them has a lasting power. Dr. Truman, I want to get to the... Um the current cultural moment, if you will, and, and, and really the heart of your book, which is the secular revolution as it exists now, where people are defining themselves purely by, the, as you mentioned in your talk earlier, by their sexual desires and what they prefer. And I'm not talking about the, what the American comedian called the alphabet people, the LGBTQIA+, plus, whatever. You, in your book, you unpack that a little bit by showing some contradictions within that yeah. <clears throat> movement, if you can call yeah. it that. Um, gays and lesbians still believe in a binary, yeah. men and women, right? But queer people and transgender people don't yeah. accept yeah. that. Feminists, you know, um, don't accept a male transitioning to become a female as a woman. Yeah. Um, how? Where do you think this is headed in terms of, do you think it'll actually splinter because of those things? Yeah. Or do you think it'll actually you know, come apart because of those differences eventually? I think it is splintering before our eyes. Uh, you know, you, if you look at feminism, you know, feminism is hopelessly divided over the issue of uh, transgenderism, the status of men claiming to be women, women claiming to be men, uh, because of the, the debate over the normativity of 
female physiology. Uh, so I, I, where I think it's heading is this, I think that we will ultimately see the triumph of what I call queerdom, that politically this is being, this will be pushing towards queerness as, as the category, which in some ways is an empty category. It's, it's the category that negates all other categories. It's fluid. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, I use in the, in the book to illustrate this, I pull this anecdote from uh, a major feminist uh, uh, book, actually. And it's the story, it's, it's, a, it's a personal testimony of a woman who's been living with another woman in a lesbian relationship for maybe a decade. And then she finds that her uh, lesbian partner is now convinced that, um, uh, the partner is convinced that she is a man trapped in a woman's body, so she transitions to being a man. Mm. And that leaves the original woman with this real dilemma, and, and what's going to, is she now straight because she's sexually attracted to a woman who's become a man? Uh, uh, and and if, if she is, then she loses her own identity as a lesbian. Uh, on the other hand, if she maintains her identity as a lesbian, she denies the identity of her partner. And at the end of this anecdote, she says, and, uh, but, but ultimately I've become very happy in my queer identity, which is kind of any, anything, anything goes. goes. Yeah, it's the category that denies all, all categories. Category. So I think politically what we will see is if things continue on the track they're going down, uh, the T and the Q will ultimately consume all of the others. Mm. I mean, I'm, it's not a particularly useful piece of information for most of the people in this room, but the number of lesbian bars in the United States now is very small. I think it could be single figures. Uh, now, it, it's possible that lesbian bars have more or less disappeared because, hey, it's safer for lesbians to go into ordinary bars. Now, that's one possible explanation. A more persuasive explanation is that, that lesbianism itself is in a kind of crisis because of transgenderism. Mm. And if you don't know what a woman is, then you can't really know what a lesbian is. Uh, so I, I, I think that what we will witness is the, uh, the triumph of the Q mm. in the end, queerness. Mm. And just as, a, a, as an aside, you know, people say the LGBTQIA, the inclusion of the I in that uh, alphabet is entirely mischievous because intersex is a medical condition. Mm. That is a medical condition, mm. and it can be treated. It's not a, it's not a question of direction mm. of sexual desire, mm. as the L, the G, and the B are, mm. nor is it a question of psychological conviction about identity which runs contrary to the body. It's actually a medical condition. And one of the ways of, of uh, obscuring the issue is to fold in the, the I with the rest. Mm. And it's a highly mischievous move, mm. I think, and one that really needs to be called out with more regularity mm. than, than it is at the moment. And, and don't forget the plus. The plus. Because that, I think, that so many letters that were being us. added. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's so many letters were being yeah. added. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen the pride flag as well. You know, it, you know, a new color. Each year the pride yeah. flag is modified. New, yeah. If you use last year's pride right. flag, man, you're a right wing reactionary. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very it's a, yeah. through the looking glass, I can say. Um, well, yeah. Shekhamza, you, in a, the last piece you wrote for Renovation, if you're going, and if you haven't read it, you should really re read it. It, um, it was titled The Cultural Devolution, and you talked about victimhood culture, but one of the points you made relates to what we're talking about here. You talked about the, you know, um, the normative center being displaced. Marginalized, right. Yeah, the marginal, the peripherals are kind of become. Yeah. Well, we have this. Just talk about that yeah, a little bit. We, if you I mean, we have this concept of, and, and so this exists within Christianity also, this idea of qalb al haqaiq the inversion of realities. And mm -hmm. it's something that the devil is noted for, is, is to invert things. And so you centralize the marginal and you marginalize the, the central. I mean, one of the key uh, aspects of critical theory is to do that. It's to flip things. Um, it's to foreground the background. And, to, and, mm -hmm. and in some ways, it can be a useful exercise sometimes because you, you see things that you hadn't noticed before. And, and that's why you know, there is some truth. But um, you know, if, if, if you, if you want to get at a lot of the... Um, madness, so to speak, 
of, of what's happening because a lot of people are feeling, especially those who grew up in a world that had some level of commit to, uh, commitment to rationalism. Like Chomsky is a good example of somebody who, despite whatever political positions he has, he still has a commitment to rationalism. To rationalism. Yeah. Like he, he believes in reason mm -hmm. as a concept. Um, this is being lost. And, I, and there is a, a person who I think is really important. Um, it's when the tome arrived, I almost pulled a muscle lifting it. But um, it's a book that a man who, he was an Oxford professor of an social anthropology, J.D. Unwin. And he wrote a book called Sex and Culture. And in that book, he, he actually studied 86 societies. And he determined that the creative energy of a society becomes completely dissipated once it unleashes sexuality. And so he said that if, and he identifies prenuptial and postnuptial continents. He said the most important was prenuptial continents, mm. that when young people begin to explore sexuality before marriage, it completely dissipates the energies of, of the society. And he saw that within three generations, and he identified a generation as, as 33 years, he saw within three generations uh, the society would have lost monogamy, um, religion, and rational thinking. And he said he did not find any exceptions to that in all. And this is not a Christian. He, he said, I have no moral judgment. I, this is, he, he was a, a social anthropologist. So we are well into the second generation because he, he identified the first generation, which would be the 60s, when, when these ideas were abandoned. And a lot, people don't realize this, but you know, a lot of these cultural events that happened in the 60s were already indicating some of these things. If you, if you look, for instance, you know, at the Beatles, the Beatles have Aleister Crawley on the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely right. Hearts Club yeah. as one of their influences. He was actually in, in a BBC um, poll was 73 out of the 100 most influential Br British people in all of history. Um, I, I do want to um, talk about the, the current public discourse that's taking place about you know, the sexual identities. Um, and one of the things I, I, I want to ask you about this is about this idea of liberalism itself. You know, people have been arguing, believers or even some secular people who are pushing back are framing this as a issue of freedom of speech for us, you know, or religious freedom. But that still, those are all liberalism notions and ideas from liberalism. And the question really I'm thinking about here is that that's the political philosophy, liberalism, that you know, produced what we're actually facing. That's where this came from. And so the idea that do you believe that liberal values you know, and making alliances with secular segments of society who are in agreement with us, is that part of the solution or is that actually part of the problem? You know, how do we use those terms to, to actually fix it? Because liberalism can't fix itself in many ways. I'm just curious about your thoughts well, on that. Well, uh, there's a, uh, an article that was written in 1951, Aro Kolnoy, who was a, a very interesting, called The Three Writers of the Apocalypse. And he actually identified a kind of totalitarianism in three uh, fascism, communism, but the third, he said, was the one that nobody saw it coming, which was what he called progressive liberalism. The seeds of it were mm -hmm. there, you know, and I mentioned that to, uh, to um, very, very esteemed uh, professor from Princeton, and, and he said, well, you know, they didn't produce, you know, the pogroms and the Nazis and this, and that. I said, not yet, like, we haven't seen mm. where this is going. So I, th I think without a, a religious tradition. I mean, it's very interesting. Benjamin Rush, who was, who was, I think, he's my favorite of all the founding Kind-hearted. fathers, yeah. But Benjamin Rush said that the system of government that we have is predicated on a religious belief. Mm -hmm. And he said, even if uh, the Americans take Mohammedanism as their code, it would still work. But without it, it won't. And, and I, th I really think that they understood that, that you cannot ground, you can have a secular person who is moral, 
But, but I would argue that their morality is the remnants of the, of the Christian capital that they're, they're living on. And, and, uh, but nonetheless, I do believe there are very moral, secular people. Um, but you can't ground morality in mm. secularism. It, it will always be positivistic. It will always be simply the arbitrary nature of the law. And once you have that, then it's, you're in the Foucauldian world of just its power that will determine mm. um, what's right and what's wrong. And right now, um, the religious people are very powerless, and, and, uh, and these materialists, are, are, you know, they, they have uh, their voice now. And, and there's a little bit of a payback, I think, you know. I mean, I, th I mm -hmm. think looking back and looking at the repression and oppression uh, throughout history, I think there is a kind of, how does it feel? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, Philip Reef that I deal with in the, in the larger book, uh, uh, Freudian sociologist, but makes a point somewhere that, that Western society at the moment is in a unique position in that it now, it's faced with having to justify itself on the basis of itself. And he observes that's, ne that's never been successfully done in history. Typically societies have always looked beyond themselves to something transcendent uh, in order to organize, or some sacred order in order to organize their social order. And I think that, I mean, that I think kind of summarizes uh, what you've just said, Sheikh Humza. And also, I think one of the, the symptoms of this is that, and I say this to students in class, that you'll see uh, less and less confidence in, in democratic process and more and more of the big questions in society being determined by either executive order or by Supreme Court. That's the, the idea of a common consensus that one can achieve among the people disappears and everything defaults to the kind of Foucaultian power plays. Right. How many seats can we get on the Supreme Court? Will our man in the White House sign an executive order? Right. Uh, so I think we see all the signs around us of uh, a democratic process. It's, it's not irredeemable. I, some people say it's like living in Weimar, Germany. I think Weimar, Germany was very different to the United States today. No history of strong democratic institutions. It had just lost a world war. No real strong history of national identity. I think America is in a much better position than that. But we are seeing symptoms emerging that shows that at least at this point in time, uh, the social order is becoming very equivocal. A, right. Uh, we have nothing beyond it to ground it. I mean, I don't think all the early founding fathers were Orthodox Christians, but they had a sort of vague belief in God and the moral shape of the universe that sort of organized things right. for them on a well, I think they understood. I mean, even Hume, you know, arguably would, would have, yeah. you know, would have said you really don't want the masses to become atheists. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, they, the elite always understood the social utility yeah. of religion. Yeah. And, and in fact, that's a Marxian uh, argument against yeah. it, right, yeah. is that it's, it's basically to control people, yeah. which doesn't explain why they, all the great world religions arose in the crucible of persecution. Right. You know, so they, <laughs> they weren't in power. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, I think um, the hyper, what, what uh, Gregory calls the hyper pluralism, which is happening, I think is a very dangerous thing because I think you do, you, you know, religio, this idea of the milla, of something that holds and binds people together. 90% um, of people identified with Christianity only a few decades ago in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now it's at 64%. And, there, and, and this is J.D. Unwin's argument that, that religion goes, you know. And so, uh, you know, the hypersexualization of our, of our culture and civilization, what some call, you know, the pornification of America, is, is a very dangerous sign because uh, one of the things that uh, Dorothy Sayers argues is that when people lose religion, they often replace it with this kind of Dionysian, uh, you know, the bacchanalia of, mm. of sexual orgiastic uh, expression. But the danger of that is that it ends up what Unwin said, that you're going, your society cannot sustain itself and, and there's a very interesting 
because the, the, the Latin term for, for um, lust was luxuria, right. which is a society that is surfeited. It, it, it's so satiated that it begins to explore um, you know, lust as, and, and it gets darker and darker as it moves along because it needs a higher level of stimulus. But those daughters that come out of luxuria are, are very terrifying because self-love, there's eight daughters of lust, mm -hmm. you know. Self-love is, 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 is one of them. Hatred of God, you know, to, that you begin mm -hmm. to hate God for depriving you of those pleasures, right? And then inconstancy, uh, distraction, become, which is also one of, in Rabelais' uh, Abbey of Thelema, distraction was one of his three mm -hmm. virtues. You know, so their inconstancy and, and thoughtlessness, you know, what we call ghafla. And then um, the abhorrence of, uh, of the afterlife. You know, but with despair, there's a despair that goes with it. Because one of the reasons that you can constrain yourself sexually is hope for uh, achieving a greater glory. You know, so, but once you lose that hope, you have the despair. You know, so... so um, and, and then a kind of uh, rashness, and finally love of the world. So these are, these are the daughters that result from uh, somebody giving completely into incontinence, mm -hmm. which isn't even a word anymore, like it's used in medicine, medicine. <laughs> for somebody that can't hold their urine or feces. But it used to be a, a, a very important moral term uh, in our culture. I wanna, um, as we wind down here, I want to ask about you know, how do all of us in this room, presumably, and people who are, you know, um, believe in biological sex and the binary, um, one of the arguments we always face in the public square is, um, you know, you need to have some compassion. These are people experiencing gender dysphoria, and um, this is who they really believe they are. There should be some sympathy for them, some recognition of their wanting to assert themselves or what I'd like to have both of you you put on your pastor or your sheikh hat on in this case and and tell us where's the line between compassion and acceptance where do you draw that line it's an interesting question and it, it to some extent when I was teaching at seminary, students would say to me, you know, Professor, what would you do in this situation? And my answer was always, well, every situation is unique, so it's very diff difficult to provide a one-size-fits-all. But I think in a Christian context, if I was faced with a, a young man, as I have been, uh, struggling with, say, gender dysphoria, first thing I would want to do strategically, pastorally, is, is get him to tell me how it started, why he thinks that way, how does it present itself. I'd want, first of all, him to know that I cared for him as a person. Uh, secondly, I, I think I would want to, you know, and again, make this general point, I don't think any, any decent human being desires to see somebody struggling with gender dysphoria or same-sex attraction suffering. I mean, it's not that the solutions we propose are designed to hurt these people. Uh, we actually want to best help them. And so, for example, on gender dysphoria, I would say the evidence seems to suggest that uh, physical transitioning does not solve the problem. Suicide rates are catastrophic for people who've transitioned, the same as they are for people who haven't transitioned, which would suggest to me that the solution is not biological transitioning, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's something else. So all of those to preface that, I say we need to care for the individual uh, and we need to, to also press on that individual that whatever we do relative to them, arises out of that love for them. Now, as a Christian, what am I going to do? I'm going to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm going to have confidence that, that God can transform, uh, that the Holy Spirit can work in the lives of an individual and transform. That isn't always the case. We all struggle with things as Christians that, you know, we can spend a lifetime struggling with them and maybe God does not take them away from us. But I do want to press the person uh, towards the supernatural. I don't think that uh, my own view of homosexuality, transgenderism, et cetera, et cetera, these are not purely physical, physiological or psychological issues. They're spiritual issues as well, and therefore I'd want to bring some sort of spiritual mm. care to bear. And for me, that would involve, you know, 
You need to be in church on a Sunday. You need to hear God's word preached. You need to be, uh, particularly with the transgender issue, I think a lot of it is to do with a desire to belong, uh, a desire to be loved and affirmed. You need to be part of a community. A church should be providing that kind of hospitable community for people. Sheikh Hamza, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that a lot of, um, I mean, certainly with young people, what's happening with the children to me is just, it's abusive Mm. um, and it's just wrong. And I think more people need to speak out against it. I don't think children should be put on puberty blockers, thing, you know, not even FDA approved yeah. as drugs for that, which is amazing that nobody seems to really... I mean, when you think about that there isn't a single state in the United States, of all 50 states, where an under 18-year-old can get a tattoo, because that would be regarded as too traumatic a change of the body. And yet we can have these transgender it's treatments amazing. for kids under yeah. 18. That shows you how perverted the thinking about children their bodies is in the United States at this point. Loss of rationalism. Yeah. That's Unwin's argument. So, um, so I, I, you know, and then we have to, you know, our Prophet Sallallahu predicted these things. So we were told that towards the latter days you would see much more of these things. So this is something that we have to be aware of, that these are the tribulations of the latter days. Um, and uh, I, I think there are things that we don't fully understand. We have a lot of estrogen mimickers in, 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 uh, in the world today with plastics. Um, we also have m- millions of women, if not hundreds of millions, on uh, estrogen uh, pills and progesterone. So they've got these um, hormones flowing in their body that are not normal to the physiology of their body. Many of them get pregnant during this time. We don't know what that's doing to the developing fetus. I mean, there's, there's so many things that we don't fully understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Aristotle in, in the Nicomachean Ethics mentions that um, pederasty was one of the reasons, uh, early childhood trauma was one of the reasons. I mean, he doesn't use that word childhood trauma, but he says children that were uh, molested often end up having those proclivities when they get older. So. This isn't something new. He also mentions in the politics that um, one of the Greek city-states uh, promoted homosexuality as a form of birth control. Mm-hmm. And I think the globalists who really feel that we're way overpopulated, I think a lot of them uh, are promoting these things because they want to see less people born. They, that's why they promote abortion, uh, birth control pills, all of these things. So, you know, but to, to answer the question, I think it's a, a case-by-case uh, okay. basis. I don't think there's any one answer. But I, I totally concur with, um, with Dr. Truman that the, the supernatural, we cannot. There, there's, a, there's a hadith of our Prophet ﷺ that says, لا تكلني إلى نفسي طرفة عين. Do not leave me to my, to my soul for even the blink of an eye. Mm. You know, that without without divine aid, we can do nothing. And uh, the poet said, you know, إِذَا لَمْ يَكُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ لَلْعَبْلِ نَاصِرًا فَأَكْثَرُ مَا يَجْنِي عَلَيْهِ اشْتِهَادُهُ That if God's aid is not helping the servant of God, then the thing that most harms him is his own efforts. And so people, and, and you know, when I was uh, going to school in Southern California, there was this, uh, uh, group they were called Victory Outreach, and they had drug addicts that cold turkey by discovering, um, you know, their Christianity. Cold turkey, mm-hmm. and and really gave it up overnight. And we know that's true with with many Muslims. Uh, we've seen that in in uh, in certain communities where if if they really embrace in a deep way faith. Um, these things are, everything is something to overcome. We definitely have to have compassion for people because these are grave tribulations um, and we're living in a very unnatural world, I think, uh, hence through the looking glass. I mean, he wrote that book to show us what a world would, he was a logician, he was a teacher of logic, mathematical logic. So he wanted to show what a world would look like without reason. And so in that, that way, we really have gone through the looking glass. Because Humpty Dumpty has the argument with Alice 
about words. And she said, it can't mean that. And Humpty Dumpty says, it can mean whatever I say it means. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's who's going to be master. That's that the real the decision, decision. Yeah. right? So, yeah. I mean, Humpty Dumpty, you know. <laughs> but he eventually fell off the wall. And all, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him back together again. And that's what's going to happen to our society. Where, you know, all the king's horses and all the king's right. men won't be able to put it back together again if that world uh, becomes the world that we all share. Um, we're almost out of time, but I want you to, both of you, to address one last thing quickly, if you can, um, which is, you know, when we look out what's happening and what, where this is headed, it, the picture is very bleak. I mean, it looks very, um, we feel helpless <clears throat> and we, a lot of people feel hopeless about this. So my question to both of you is to, you know, what would you say to all of us who are looking for this, whether people who are religious and other people who are secular who are still worried about this? Um, how do we find hope? How do we keep hope alive? Two thoughts. One, well, th no, three thoughts. First of all, I think there are some hints already that, that some aspects of the sexual revolution may be turned back. Mm -hmm. I do think on the transgender issue, for some of the reasons you've just outlined, uh, you know, you can fight nature for only so long. I think we could well see on the transgender issue within the next four, maybe not in my lifetime, but within the next 40, 50 years, that could be turned around because I think there will be lawsuits coming. Uh, that kids who've been used as chemistry sets by their parents, by Big Pharma, uh, by the medical profession, they will sue. The 14-year-old who's been, you know, we don't allow 14-year-olds to make intelligent decisions about what to have for dinner. <laughs> How on earth can we allow them to make an intelligent decision about whether they want children in 20, 30 years' time? They will sue. And this is America, and when big lawsuits start coming down, things will change. Secondly, I think we can have hope at a local level. Uh, none of us here probably can have much of an impact on the whole of culture, but where we can have an impact is on the people we know, on our neighborhoods, in our communities, with our own children. And I think we need to be good stewards of, of, of what we have. Uh, if identity is grounded in strong community, then we should be strong communities. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be strong communities, whatever the government does. In fact, history would suggest that when governments come after certain groups, those groups become stronger communities. The LGBTQ movement is a good example of that. So, uh, and again, one of, I don't know much about Islam, but one of the things I think Judaism, Islam, and Christianity have in common is an emphasis on hospitality, of which I was a recipient in, in Turkey all those years ago. I think hospitality is huge for building communities, for shaping the way people think. I don't remember much about the lectures I went to at college, but I do remember the professors who opened their houses to me. Uh, and I think we can all have a huge impact and we can pass on hope by being strong communities. Thirdly, and this is where you know, Christianity and, and Islam will diverge at this point, where do I find hope? I'd have to say the promise to the church. Okay. You know, the promise is to church, the gates of hell will not prevail. We know who wins in the end. Jesus wins in the end. So as a Christian, I look to the promise to the, to the church at the end of that. But I think there are two of those three points we, we should be able to agree on. No, no, thanks for that. Go ahead, check on Well, we believe Jesus wins yes, in the of end, course. too. <laughs> so, we don't have a problem with that. <laughs> um, I just want to read something because, you know, I, the people at Zaytun have heard me, this is like beating the dead horse, but I genuinely believe that liberal education is one of the most important antidotes to a lot of this madness. And, and I just want to read from uh, Dr. Truman's uh, book here. He says, take for example, education. Traditional notions of education assumed that students were raw material in need of training, which would shape them into adult members of society by imparting skills and knowledge necessary for fitting into the larger social framework that is the adult world. This vision was not simply technical. Liberal arts education also saw the teaching of the great classics of culture, literature, art, music, philosophy, as shaping the student's understanding of what it means to be human. To be educated was to be transformed by exposure to a range of ideas, whether one agreed with them or not. 
Once society accepts the basic Rousseau-style premise that culture is what makes us inauthentic by perverting the voice of nature and then refracts this through the critical lenses provided by Nietzsche, Marx, Freud, and the new left of Reich and Marcuse, this traditional notion of education must be abandoned. So I, I genuinely believe liberal education is the antidote uh, in the deepest sense of that, teaching people really to think deeply, mm -hmm. to engage ideas with, with, with the tools that enable them to see through falsehood. Um, I, I was uh, once asked to uh, contribute to a book of all these different religious prayers and to put your favorite prayer of, of your prophet in, in uh, and so the prayer that I chose was Allahumma arini al haqqa haqqa wa rizqni attiba'a wa arini al batira batira wa rizqni ishtinaba Our Prophet said, O oh God, show me the truth as truth and let me follow it and show me falsehood as falsehood and let me avoid it and that desire to know the truth is a human desire, uh, pointed out in the opening statement of the metaphysics, that all, all people really do want to know, and they want to know the truth, and the truth shall, shall set thee free. So we, we have to uh, promote truth. We believe in truth, we're people of truth, and as long as truth is in the world, there's hope. Uh, and, and the Qur'an clearly states that when, when truth comes, falsehood vanishes. So we need more truth. It's a great place to end. Please join me in thanking both of our speakers tonight.